Um, welcome to today's event. Welcome to Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, my name is Francis X. Johnson. I'm a senior research fellow here at SEI. Um, as you might know, the uh, SEI has a, a special relation to the Stockholm Conference this week. Uh, the SEI takes its name from that conference, uh, as well as its mission and its mandate. And um, it's a very special week for us, and uh, the SEI is very much involved in the events. And um, the uh, SEI also has a, a quite interesting history when it comes to the IPCC. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the predecessor of the IPCC, the Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases, our first director was uh, deeply involved. And our chair, one of our chairs, um, Eric Berlin, was also the chair of the IPCC, first chair, in fact. So um, I'd like to uh, start off by introducing um, Camilla Anderson. She's the Swedish focal point um, alternate for the IPCC. She's a senior researcher at the <coughs> Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute. She has a docent in meteorology and her research has focused, excuse me, <coughs> on uh, air pollution and its effects on ecosystem health and climate. Um, Camilla. Yes, <laughs> I'll be happy to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francis. And I also wish to welcome you all to, to this event, in the right. panel, which is very exciting, I think, with all these excellent speakers today. Uh, so uh, I welcome from the side of the national uh, focal point of, in IPCC uh, from Sweden. So I will start by talking a little bit about, about IPCC and, and how the work is and how the scientific evidence has evolved throughout the years. So IPCC was formed in 1988 and currently there is 195 member states in the panel. Uh, it assesses the scientific knowledge uh, and does no research of its own. Uh, it's the scientific evidence on climate change then and impact uh, on human, socioeconomy and uh, and on the uh, environment. Uh, so there is a steering board, a bureau in IPCC, and members, member states nominate authors to this to, to work uh, preparing these reports uh, in IPCC. Uh, and the member states nominate them, but the bureau decides on who participates in writing the reports. The reports are then written in three working groups, uh, one focusing on the scientific evidence of, of climate change and the anthropogenic part of it and scenarios to future, one working group on impact and adaptation effects, and one on mitigation efforts. Each working group uh, has around a few hundred people, people experts, and researchers writing the reports and they summarize the evidence uh, from thousands of scientific papers. Uh, in this process, there is also a summary for policymakers that is uh, written by the authors, and this is then discussed in detail in decision meetings in the, in the governmental panel on climate change, IPCC. Um, so what about the scientific evidence over the 30 plus years of the panel? Uh, well, the amount of evidence has increased uh, tremendously. Uh, in 1990, the first assessment report was published and this underlined the importance of climate change and its impact and also the importance of, of uh, the cooperation between countries to come to terms with this. The first two working group reports were around uh, a few hundred pages and had around a thousand scientific references, which was quite a lot still at that point. Uh, and, and, the, <laughs> sorry, and the third working group was a few uh, fewer uh, references, around a hundred. But today there is a hundredfold more 
references in the third working group and some 30 fold more references in, in working group two. So you can see there is a tremendous increase in the scientific knowledge uh, that is the basis of, of these reports. Besides the assessment reports, and uh, now we're in the sixth assessment cycle, besides these reports, there is also uh, special reports that the panel has uh, 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 summarized or written. And for instance, one focusing on one and a half degrees and, and a few on reporting emission methodologies. Besides this, uh, one thing that's worth mentioning, I think, as well, is that the IPCC also won the, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007, in the same year that the fourth assessment report was published, and this was then along with Al Gore. So we're now in the sixth assessment cycle. In the end of that, it will com be completed this uh, in October this year, and then the starting in the seventh assessment cycle. Uh, besides description of seriousness uh, of the situation and the urgency for action, uh, the report also describes possible solutions and mitigation options. And this is the, you know, uh, the amount of evidence for, for that. So the synthesis report is uh, to be published and accepted in October this year, and we look forward to that, of course. With that, I thank you, and let me give the word over to Francis. Thanks a lot, Camilla. Um, so uh, I want to quote a philosopher, historian, George Santayana, who said that uh, those who do not know history are condemned to repeat it. Um, and I think the idea for our event today, which came several months ago, um, relates to this sort of um, policy space in which we happen to work here at SEI, um, in which you're thinking so much about what has happened very recently. Um, but we have to really take the time to reflect on um, what has happened over, over decades. And that's why the case of the IPCC is particularly interesting. Um, in many ways, it's the most prominent of all the scientific assessments and has this rather special relation to to both policymakers but also society in general. Um, so a few practical um, points today is those of you who are joining online, you can send your questions anytime on the chat and uh, that will come later. We will take a pause at what time? Yeah, we'll take a, a pause at, at 11. Um, so let's let's go to the to the panel. I'd like to first uh, introduce our moderator. Lisa Schiffer is a research fellow at the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford. Uh, she works on adaptation and vulnerability in the context of development. She was a coordinating lead author in the um, uh, chapter on climate resilient development in working group two, and she's been the lead author on the special report on extreme events and uh, lead author also in the AR5 working group too. So Lisa. Thanks Francis. Thank you, welcome to you and welcome to the panel. Um, I probably sound awkwardly here so I can see which is not yet. Yeah. Um, so I'm really excited to, oh gosh, um, IPCC has made my vision really bad, so I'm <laughs> having a hard time now. I'm in the in-between age where I'm trying to look at what I've written and also look at you and be able to see. So I'm, I'm just really happy to be here. I've spent a lot of time thinking about the IPCC. I've spent a lot of time writing for the IPCC. As Francis said, I've also, when I was doing my PhD, I worked for the Earth Negotiations Bulletin, and during that time I was reporting on the IPCC uh, panel events. So I was sitting in the back of the room listening to countries talk about sort of what to do with the reports. And as far as I can remember, the first one I was at was somehow around in the third assessment cycle. So it would have been around 2000, 2001. Um, so then I think uh, personally, as a, a scientist working in the interface of climate development, it was sort of a goal to be an IPCC author. So I was very excited when I had the opportunity. Um, and 
I, I do think, though, that it is, we are at a moment where we really need to reflect on what is actually what we've done in the past. What has this what has the scientific process contributed to? Because now more than ever, it's clear we're in group one, we're here two, we're in group three, the special reports in the sixth assessment cycle. Very clear that the time to act is absolutely minimal. And so if we think about that context, then what exactly what, what will the IPCC process look like over the next few years? Uh, I personally, because I'm partly supported by the Swedish government and also by the UK from, from being based at Oxford, I've already been approached by the UK focal point asking, can we have a discussion about the next round? What is the seventh assessment report cycle going to look like? Do you have any suggestions? And to some extent, I'm very excited and honored to have the opportunity, but it's also like, well, maybe we need to step back and think a little bit about kind of where are we going with this? And is it really, do we really want to start thinking about Right, sort of business as usual IPCC when we know that by the time we finish that report actually will hit against the deadlines that were set in the 1.5 report and also have been reinforced by the, the subsequent working group reports now. So I think we're sort of, you know, but and simultaneously we have very clearly society and academics asking sort of where is the action. Um, Recently, there was a paper uh, published in the journal that I happened to be co-editor of climate development that caused a lot of sort of reflections in and among climate scientists. And it was suggesting that actually we should abandon, maybe walk out scientists, climate scientists should abandon the process because the governments weren't taking action. So, you know, is that the way to, to do it? I think nuanced reflections recognize that we can't just abandon the knowledge process because it's fundamental and vital. But at the same time, we do need to think about what it's actually being used for. So I think, uh, you know, this, um, I mentioned everything I want to say. So yeah, so in order to think about what's ahead, then we also need to think about what we've already accomplished. And that's why this event, I think, comes at a really, really good time. Uh, there are a lot of things that are kind of around the IPCC, and if you ask any IPCC also in the room, um, you will get <laughs> thoughts about sort of, oh, how much time I've sacrificed, how much my family has suffered, how much sleep I've lost, how frustrating some of the process is. Um, and I think that's that's sort of, yeah, that's the immediate reaction. And you can see there are definitely papers published after each of the cycles where authors are reacting to how difficult how difficult um, their life was during this this period but there are some more concrete issues as well and one of them is about how to make sure that we have a diversity of voices not just represented represented uh, in the uh, among the authors but actually able to actively participate and get their perspectives heard and I think this is a very um, this is a very challenging because in some ways the way that the IPCC is structured but Times are changing and the literature that we're looking at is changing as well. And as Tamina pointed out, there's a huge amount of literature. And it's, for instance, we've got a tremendous amount of climate justice now. That was not something that we talked about in, in previous reports very much, but the literature is so incredibly massive that you can't ignore it any longer. So, of course, it plays a huge role, especially in working group two. Good. So that's sort of I, I am sure that the panelists are going to bring lots of fascinating um, issues to the table today and I'm sort of I've asked them to reflect a little bit on a few things for those who have been involved as authors or in, in other ways focal points um, to reflect on their experience and what they think is sort of yeah how was, how was this experience to think about the impacts that the reports have had what do they see uh, the impacts um, do they think what they think is good about the IPCC and what do they think maybe needs to change um, and, and also sort of in terms of the society, the, the science society relationship, what can we what can we see from that is is um, sort of society picking up the reports or is it just something that ends up on a shelf in um, SMO or something, you know, where we say, OK, here we've done this and the science is there. But does it actually go Do people sort of on the ground also find these reports useful? Of course, they're really difficult to read. Uh, so, to, yeah, so we're going to go through, I'm going to give the, the panelists are going to have a chance to reflect on these thoughts, whatever they want, and um, then we're going to go back for a few more thoughts. So you get first three minutes and then 
you get another two minutes and then we'll have a little break who at 11 and then there'll be a um, chance for audience to ask questions and also for those who are online can put questions in chat and then um, we'll have a final round for all of the panelists to say something and then we'll close so that's how we're going to do it and uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists and I think I'm going to go um, introduce you all at once maybe <laughs> just to, <laughs> so, so that we can move from one, um, one person and then you can also know how the order that I'm going to ask you in so I'm I I'm going to start with Marianne Lidia Quart, who is the former IPC focal point and who was my first kind of contact point as, as a Swedish author. Uh, so for me, that's sort of where my IPCC career started. And um, she is now retired, but she's very kindly come back to help us to kind of think about these things. Um, and she was a senior research officer in the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency for more than 20 years. Um, so she's she and, and also at was focal point from 1999 to 2013. And one of her main interests is adaptation. And so she's worked in different different sort of intergovernmental processes on adaptation uh, and took uh, including SEI's Arctic Resilience Report and other kinds of things like that. Uh, so that Marianne is going to go first. And then I'm going to ask Lisa Thomas, who is who works, has worked for the last decade in various roles on adaptation resilience in the UN. So Cinta is works in, in the Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, but she's also uh, she's also the first Baltic uh, author from Latvia who has been part of an IPCC report. She was lead author in the report, which came out in 2019, uh, is review editor at Work Number 2 in Chapter 17 on um, governance and uh, is also lead author in the forthcoming synthesis report. So we have sort of just has a wide experience in the AR6 and 6 assessment cycle. Uh, then we're going to go Edith Jastam, who is a global climate correspondent for Swedish television. And she has a lot of experience. She's a former foreign correspondent in Africa, EU and US. And she also has a really interesting book called Klimaoptimism in Sverige, which is about how climate change is transforming Sweden. Um, it's, it's just in Swedish only maybe at this point? I think it will only <laughs> remain in Swedish. <laughs> okay. yeah. Well, then for those who don't speak Swedish, it's time to learn Swedish. Um, so, so yes, so, and it is going to yeah, give us a perspective, obviously, not as an IPCC author and scientist, but for somebody who's been reporting on climate and environment issues for a long time. And so to Marco, Marco Rumokainen, who is the climate advisor at Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute, SMHI, and he's the current Swedish IPCC focal point. Um, and he's also a professor in climatology at Lund University. So on top of that, he has also been involved in IPCC as an author, as a reviewer. Um, Mark was, was lead author in the fifth assessment report. Um, <coughs> so he has also a lot of different kinds of experience and will be able to give us some insights into sort of also this role of sitting as a government representative as, as well as being a scientist. Um, OK, and then uh, let's see how, how I ordered Toya, Toya Vestai. So Toya is here she is, um, she's a passionate nature lover, and she's also, she became an activist in 2018. And she's, Toya is, is um, actually reached out to me when, when the IPCC, the Work Group 2 report came out and asked me to present on the report to something called Researcher's Desk, which is actually a very, really active and, and exciting um, kind of, can I say portal or something for for it's a place for um, kind of science and society to come together and I think that uh, she's she's read carefully the report she's she's very keen on raising awareness about um, climate and environmental issues I guess but um, yeah and she's she's really been actively sort of absorbing all of the literature that's come up for the last 30 years and then we're going to go to Georgia Savidu, who Georgia is, she's a researcher at Chalmers University in uh, Technology, and she's also a research affiliate with the University of Cyprus. 
And Georgia ha has a lot of interesting experience. In particular, she's worked with SCI and she's worked on um, the development of the Aid Atlas, which has it's an online platform for visualizing international development finance flows. So because of that, she's also was a contributor, a contributing author in the Africa chapter in work <coughs> too. Uh, and particularly on adaptation finance to African countries, which is a huge topic and it comes up over and over again in any kind of forum where I've been presenting the report is where are these blocks and why sort of what, how can we get action going? Um, so that's, that's a, a really important topic uh, and will continue to be massive, I think. So with that, I'm now going to ask Marianne to start with her a few comments and um, yeah, and I will try to keep time. So three minutes, I'll be a little bit strict since we have a lot of <laughs> people and so yeah, I want to, want to give you all a chance to say something. Well, thank you for inviting me and uh, three minutes, it's uh, not so long. And I, I would first like to tell you about my first impression from the IPCC meeting. It was in Costa Rica and dealing with a, a special report on aviation. Uh, I was totally stunned about the long, endless discussions on language and uh, wording. So for me, a non-English speaking person or non-English native <laughs> English speaking, it, it didn't really change the message for what was discussed. <clears throat> but uh, well, but um, I also saw the necessity to give the summary for policy makers, the countries um, uh, to comment uh, on those uh, summaries, because I think that will make the more trustworthy and uh, as an open process. And uh, the summary for policymakers are at least meant to be written for the policymakers in the national governments to the climate convention. But still, as I heard from the latest uh, meetings, you can argue if this has to be changed in some way to make the language more easy. Uh, there is, I think, uh, Sweden has translated um, all those um, messages from the very beginning, I think. So we try really to have this information in, on the table. Uh, so uh, I, I think um, the awareness of the climate change has constantly increased, not only here in Sweden, but globally. So that the IPCC makes a difference, that uh, for sure. Uh, and you can also see uh, we were given the task to uh, follow one topic and uh, I thought the adaptation, impacts adaptation is uh, worth to look at the interaction, how it came around. At the um, COP meeting in The Hague in 2000, mitigation were discussed in plenum, but uh, many people had picked up the impacts and well, I don't think they talked about adaptation then, but still the necessity to also focus on the impacts and how to deal with those impacts. So only one year later, uh, when Sweden had the, I mean this is the, we also, we had the um, EU presidency. Uh, and uh, then we had Axelie Beauchelet, who should be well known here in the SEI. He was uh, the uh, EU president for leading the chat. Uh, we had a, a European research group for, by uh, IPCC focused points. Uh, who wanted to coordinate the impacts research in Europe. And we proposed to the negotiations uh, to take this impacts research as a subgroup for the, well, the re um, working parties and the substance work. And actually it was um, approved as an agenda point and then it has improved over the years, but I think still it is on the agenda. So that is 
how I see the impacts came into the negotiations. Well, uh, there is very many different words coming up and also ways it has constantly increased the aspects of how to handle risks and vulnerability and for the the lay people, it's not always so easy to understand what those um, words really mean. You have societal transformation, for example. Uh, what is that? What does that really mean? It was huge discussions during my last meeting in uh, in the AR5, some report policy meet, meetings, and uh, then this uh, resilience. Um, word. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 you can understand it, but it's not easy to convey how you, in an easy way, how you should look at it. So I think wording is very important to use some word and language that is understandable for well, people who has to deal with the reports. So, um, I think that is more of the meaning as well. <laughs> Thank you. I stopped for the moment. Yes, that's great. And in fact, I think that leads very nicely into Vinta's um, comments, hopefully, uh, precisely about how to communicate better some of these really critical and difficult parts of climate, the climate change. So. Thanks. Was put on my timer, so I don't go <laughs> over. Um, so I wanted to share with you a little bit about how the IPCC has conducted risk assessments and how this has changed over time. And um, risk and understanding the risks from climate change is a key um, kind of theme and message from the IPCC reports. And it, it, the first um, risk assessment uh, it was, uh, I think, the third assessment report. Um, where they developed something called, for the first time, burning embers. Now, these are basically these figures that look like there's almost like they're kind of traffic lights or, or flames. They start with white and then go yellow, red, and dark purple to indicate risk at different temperatures. And in the third assessment report, that's around 2000, there were five burning embers for what they called reasons of concern. So things like tipping points or the global distribution of impacts. In this most recent report, I think you've had something like 30 or 40 burning embers on everything from risk of malaria to risk to food supply, etc. So there's been a huge proliferation of these embers. Um, and it's a good example of how it shows how the process has changed. So over time, for example, the purple color, which means high risk, was introduced in the fifth assessment report. Now you have these, as I said, mentioned, many specific risk assessments or risk kind of sectoral embers. Um, and it's also, it shows, you know, the process itself has been improved over time. Initially, it was, um, you had authors kind of just looking at the literature and saying, oh, I think around 1.5 degrees, you might have a problem. But now that process is very formalized. There's kind of an expert assessment and elicitation process. It's very clearly documented. So there's been improvements in this. Um, there's also, I would say, huge gaps in, in, in ways we can continue to improve. So right now we have this, you'll see some, some evidence of how um, some of the conclusions are that risk, that there's higher risk at lower temperatures. And some of the questions that well, is this because the literature has improved, because the science has improved, or understanding is bigger? Or is it because people have just kind of changed the way that they're doing this assessment? And so going forward, what we really need to do is compile all this information, have like a database that, that future authors could refer to, where the methods are very clear, that we could build on as we go to the seventh cycle, for example. And there is work within the IPCC to do this. Um, and I think these risk assessments are also an example of how the IPCC has really influenced policy because uh, those embers in the process of these kind of looking at these risks has helped influence that, that 1.5 and 2 degree goal. Because many of these embers show 
that actually we start switching to high or very high risks around 1.5 degrees or, or two degrees of, of global uh, warming. And, and so there's kind of this direct link of how the IPCC has influenced the policy process by looking at these, these embers. Um, so that's my three minutes, and I'll end there and, and hopefully add some more personal reflections later. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Right. So we're, we're <clears throat> yes, so we're going from thinking about language, thinking about kind of what are these difficult things to communicate, a way of communicating risk. And now we actually get to hear also a little bit from Edith. How, yeah, how does one communicate this? Uh, what do, what does the public want to know about the IPCC and also yeah, other reflections that you have on sort of reporting on this and interest in the past? <laughs> Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Um, I follow IPCC very closely, of course. That is my job as global climate correspondent, which is the position I was given uh, almost three years ago. It's the first time that Swedish television have tried that. And my mission or my job is to travel and try to find actually constructive solutions, but also a report on uh, climate change. And I'm sort of trying to balance the message between the severity of the situation, but also this spring I've spent a lot of time traveling, finding the viable climate solutions. I just came back from Spain yesterday, uh, visiting the world's largest green hydrogen plant that was actually inaugurated just uh, a week ago. Um, so I'm, I'm somewhere in there. Um, I think bottom line, what we're approaching, because I think we're all in agreement that politicians lack an adequate response. <laughs> to the crisis that we are in. Um, my job is not to be the activist. I'm a journalist. I have to scrutinize and report what I find is um, viable. But of course, by Swedish television appointing a climate correspondent, and also we have climate reporters, we have climate editors, we have a climate newsletter. As a public service company, we are communicating and have decided that this is one of the key issues. But then again, when you have a crisis like the pandemic or now with a war in Europe, I have to struggle to get my stories on the air because we seem to be capable only of addressing a crisis at the time. So I think listening to, to you here, I think the bottom line question is, does science have a, a, an obligation to save humanity from this sort of slow collective suicide that we seem to have embarked upon? Is it media's responsibility to do that? I don't have an answer, but I think it's the question we're approaching because when you guys in your latest reports, you sort of go with those traffic lights saying urgent, urgent, urgent. And my reporting is urgent, 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 and saying how many thousands of scientists that are behind this, one would think that the whole world would stop and pause and say, wow, okay, you know, this is the time for the global Marshall Plan, which I just read McKinsey have suggested will cost about, I think it was $3.5 trillion, which is about half of what the corporate profits are globally. So, you know, difficult, but not impossible. Uh, but can I actually propagate this as a journalist? You know, where do people or the viewers start to look upon me as an activist sort of pursuing a message. So what I try to do is sort of give gestalt. So for instance, when the big special report was due in August, I took the chance. I traveled with my team to Greenland. And when the report was published on August 8th, I was actually standing with my feet in the melting inland ice and saying, you know, this is what we're talking about. Because you did then finally sort of sharpen your warnings or, or your assessment of the um, melting of the inland ice. <clears throat> Finally, what I would like to say is when you, Lisa, talk about this, yes, you know, there's a lot of social sciences creeping into the policy recommendations. That is making my reporting more difficult because you are becoming more and more political. Um, so that is some that is a question I have. Is this what IPCC should be doing? Or is it what IPCC needs to do? Because David Attenborough just said recently that uh, you know, we're, we're done with the science. We have the science. Climate, the climate crisis have turned into a communication challenge. Fantastic. Thank you. Oui. Okay. Yes, I think that that's, um, that is a good, good uh, thing for us to reflect on. I'm not sure, Michael, if you're going to say anything in that direction. But um, 
I'm I'm a free agent. <laughs> well, I think the, the issue about social science is a huge one because I am a social scientist, so I do feel very strongly about, about that. But well, that's another, maybe a later discussion. So now, where do you want to go through to that one? Yeah, you were sitting through all of these recent approval sessions as well. Yes, I have seen the process from different perspectives, never from two mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, perspectives different times. And as Camilla was underlining that the amount of literature has increased tremendously over the years, which of course has made the process heavier, but also in about more people led to some changes in how work is being done, even though the basic assessment process is still as it was set, set up uh, almost more than 30 years ago. And of course now in the post Paris era, in 2015, one can ask, should there be a bigger overhaul of the classes? <laughs> changes after, and we have less time to do the most ambitious planning, education, adaptation process. But it is informative to go back and read the previous reports, the first from 1990, then 95, and so forth, and so see how the conclusions have changed. The increase in certainty, and now the that's how it is on climate becoming warmer and that we are behind that. So there are things in science which are resolved and it's not just resolved by discussion, resolved by science on the global science. There are other issues, the tipping points uh, on which there's deep uncertainty. The ocean currents response to climate change, for example, the great ice sheets, where the uncertainty answer means that we know that we do not know, but we should know more. So there's more for science to do. Or we can go through about the science of monitoring, evaluation, and adaptation. There's still a lot to do. Now in the political discussion, how to work on the global, with the new global core adaptation, what kind of indicators you can have, what can say say about that? Or the way we go through of how big are the costs of climate damages? How do the benefits, which seem to larger than the, than the costs, we can lose the money that enough, and can we do more then? The impact is there from the beginning, but one special case is the 1.5 degree report from 2018, because if you go back to Paris Agreement where the global temperature goal was well below 2 degrees, and let's have 1.5 ambition. After 1.5 report, it, it seems like 1.5 is the goal. There's no discussion about the world to release 1.5, and this is really an impact of that specific report. And numbers from that one also made their way to the uh, Glasgow decision text. So there are concrete numbers from the NPCC work. And also now the negotiation bond, and this is my final point, there will be several times when the IPCC will present findings from its uh, from the uh, last two reports in the adaptation in the overall process. Uh, but also on the so-called periodic review, which look at the adequacy of the global energy program and the collective process. So it's, it is there very, very soon. Excellent, thank you. And that's a fantastic way to, um, and also because that is really, that's starting next week. And I know because I'm going and the, the, to the SB56 that, that there's a huge demand for IPCC authors to be at various sessions and to contribute to the discussions. So I think that's uh, obviously talking about the report, not just talking about anything. But uh, but I think that it's it's really clear that the sort of the, the policy process is is I mean I think the policy process in this case is, is quite interesting because of course it comes after the report, the first report, the first assessment report came out, and then countries said, oh, we need to have a, a, some kind of global policy process. So it's clear that this this relationship is still very tight and very very important. Although it has had some bumps in the last, um, well, in, from the first report from 1.5, I guess it's caused a little bit of a bump. Um, good. Well, thank you very much. That's fantastic. And then we're going to now move to Toya um, to give us, well, kind of sort of outsider perspective, but also not really because you really also know the science. Yes, well, from an amateur perspective, but um, I have so, so much to say, I don't know where to start really, but I will start by saying thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I think that is a beautiful way to show that 
uh, you are inviting uh, different voices and uh, it's all about cooperation. And um, I really think those are the cooperation and the language are the two keys for me, and especially language. I would love to talk a lot more about language in our CC report. But um, me as an activist, uh, and many of my activist friends are worn out, and I bet so are quite a few of the IPCC authors and uh, communicators <laughs> and correspondents. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, is a lot has to do because we're not cooperating very well. Uh, especially within the activist um, organizations, uh, we all have our own ideas, little groups of how, how uh, what is most important and how to to um, uh, act on uh, our different standpoints. Uh, for example, there are a few organizations that think the IBCC report is way too uh, negotiated. And uh, there are others that use it as a pure fact. And, uh, and I think um, when when, when the wording, when, okay, I'll go back to language. When the wording is as easy as for everyone to understand, when it's a four year old person being able to understand what is being said, and it has not been negotiated. So let's go move to that uh, policy, summary for policymakers. Um, if that is too negotiated and the wording is too complicated, it's not going to reach all the activist groups. And it's not, and it's definitely not going to reach the next level of people that are interested or not interested yet, but should be interested and should start to act. So um, if we think that the wording is uh, super easy in the pol some of the policy makers at the same time as um, as we're trying to reach the hearts by those embers, burning embers, for example, such a great uh, expression or 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 vision I got in my head with a three or five of the first years and then moving back to 30, 40 the, now, nowadays. And what's happening with the next IPCC report? Is it going to be just a huge, you know, it's, it's um, as you notice, I have so much to say and I, was, I don't know where to, to start and I didn't obviously do my homework like you all know. But um, uh, so I think the cooperation between scientists social, uh, civil society and communicators is key. Uh, correspondent uh, SVT could maybe show sometimes an activist uh, demonstration a bit more. So the activists feels a little bit more that we're given a bit of muscles and, and voices and are seen and heard and respected. And um, same way with with uh, the researchers, they need help from the from the communicators uh, because it's too complicated the language and the size is so severe that we really really need to find the gas pedal here and we really need to get the information to reach people's hearts and uh, that won't happen with the wording existing today in the IPCC report. I'm uh, I'm quite sure. Um, and I think maybe the my three minutes. Anyways, I need uh, to get my head around what I'm going to say first. So, <laughs> sorry about that. No, thank you, Claire. I think that was really important. In fact, I was just, as you're saying, I was thinking about an upcoming, I'm not going to remember now, in the working group two summary for policymakers approval, because I think it was this sentence that we ended up with. with I, unfortunately, I was the author who had to discuss with the, the countries. So this is an example of a sentence. Climate resilient development pathways are progressively constrained by every increment of warming, in particular beyond 1.5 C, social and economic inequalities. The balance between adaptation and mitigation varying by national, regional and local circumstances and geographies, according to capabilities, including resources, vulnerability, culture and values, <laughs> past development choices leading to past emissions and future warming scenarios, bounding the climate resilient development pathways remaining and the ways in which development trajectories are shaped 
by equity and social and climate justice. But we have very high confidence. So. <laughs> um, but I think that is that I and I mean, I think I had the chance as an author to say, oh, this is maybe the longest sentence I've ever seen. But but I think that the point is that that's that exactly. I mean, how how is that supposed to be interpreted by anybody? And there you can clearly see there's that is tied to all of the underlying chapters of the working group two report. There's no question that there we do have very high confidence. But the way that's communicated by stringing all those phrases together makes it very, very difficult to understand and, and to parse out, but also potentially very easy to um, abuse in some ways to, to hijack as well. So I think that those are that's, that's exactly a very good good point. OK, good. So we're coming to the end of our first round now. And, and so Georgia, you have a chance to tell us now. Well, I know you had a lot of thoughts as well, um, but yeah, exactly. Sort of what what do you I've heard you experience this and also as kind of coming in relatively fresh in this IPCC process already. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm going to try to bring a, a more of a, a fresh or youth perspective on, on what we're discussing. But let me start by saying thank you so much. Uh, I'm super excited to be part of this very diverse um, panel. And thanks a lot to the audience that is here in, in the room and also the people joining online. Um, so yesterday I was in the train coming uh, to Stockholm, so I was reflecting a little bit on, on the IPCC. So we heard earlier by Camilla that it was established back in 1988, so that's three years before I was born. Um, but it's also still more than a decade after the fossil fuel industry was made aware of the catastrophic impacts of climate change. So I was reflecting yesterday how far we've managed to go in terms of climate governance all along the years, but also how far we still need to go in, well, the remaining of my lifetime. Um, so I am a contributing author to the IPCC, and that means that I didn't have to sign off uh, the chapter that I contributed off, and, and I'm kind of held accountable. So in that sense, um, my experience does not necessarily mean that I have a very deep understanding of the whole process like most or uh, all of the panelists around me uh, have uh, today. But I have been very lucky to have colleagues that have been part of the IPCC, some, some colleagues who have been part of it since the 90s. And so I was really able to um, ask all the questions, questions like um, what, uh, who does what in, in writing of the IPCC? And, what does the review process look like? Why is it that the IPCC is called the, the largest um, scientific review? And what is actually the, the essence of the I of the IPCC, this intergovernmental? Um, and why are governments play a role? And what is actually that role? Um, and so I think one of uh, the many learnings that I want to communicate today is really this intergovernmental um, part of the IPCC, and which I think it's really a key in terms of achieving the impact and where, where we've been so far, although still needing to go very far um, ahead. So it was a, a big realization to understand that it's not the authors that are members of the IPCC, but it's the actual government. And that means that, well, all the way from, from the preparation and the of, of the outline of the report all the way to final approval of the summary for policymakers, governments um, are once well approving the processes and really owning the reports. And that plays then a very big role in the negotiation process of the of the UNFCCC. So I can get uh, maybe later on back to that depending on how much time I, I have, but maybe I'll, I'd like to close that with um, talking a little bit on uh, the intergenerational equity, so much talking about uh, language, but basically what I mean by that uh, is that, um, as acknowledged by the IPCC, we know that basically the cause and effects uh, climate change uh, are, can be separated by decades or even generations. So that's on the one hand, and then on the other hand, those who bear, who bear the, the cost of mitigating and remediating and um, might not be the ones that actually reap the, the avoided harm or, or the benefits. Um, 
Uh, I do think that uh, the youth has a very uh, strong role to play in, in a number of ways um, by uh, volunteering, by being um, engaging with science or becoming scientists. Um, um, I think activism is um, uh, has such a role and um, a strong role to play. And I am talking about one of the things I think IPCC uh, the current IPCC is really um, I'm really appreciative of is actually that it has showcased a lot of activism and uh, litigation as part of that. So I'll leave it up to there and have to share more thoughts. Thank you. I think that's that's fantastic. So we've covered lots of different things, and I see that some of you are writing some notes. So I'm going to give panelists a chance to say a briefly one more thing if if you want to add something, particularly since you've heard these diverse perspectives. Then we'll have a little break so we can stretch. And then um, then we'll also get the chance to hear questions and hopefully have a good discussion with the audience. So um, I think I will go with the same order again. So Marianne, if you want to add anything more now, yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, I do think that business and policymakers understand what is said in the reports, even if they don't understand the language, but they understand the message. So uh, there is more problem, I think, to really think out of the box. What really do they dare to do? I mean, they think of re-election. So I, I guess that is one of the main obstructions for really taking a step forward. And uh, to be blunt, I think the social sciences is uh, very important, but it also makes the process more complex. Um, so, uh, so taking care of everyone's aspects when it comes to doing um, a measure, so, for example, an adaptation. That now you are talking much of maladaptation, but there are very many things you can do. But immediately. There starts a discussion. Is this the right way to do? Mm -hmm. And maybe that is what IPCC could um, try to look more into. But it's, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think they can if they will. And we saw that people are also ready to do things during the COVID, but after a while they get tired. So I think there is also a challenge in for the long term to do something important. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I think that's a very, very good point um, about sort of what is it? Because I think, I mean, hopefully it's clear to the audience that the IPCC authors come in and are faces assessing the existing literature and not, it's not a research uh, effort as Camille already explained. So you're sort of faced with now we have an overwhelming amount of evidence that there's maladaptation and that adaptation isn't going going well. So what does that mean you know, in terms of how to how to do it right? We know less about that because we just don't have as much kind of evidence. Um, so and, and we're more, more cautious um, as well. There's less confidence in sort of what, what works. So yeah, these are challenges, right? That are associated with this, the way the structure of the IPCC and also with the existing literature, which can of course be influenced by governments who can say we're going to have a huge research call, lots of funding for research in various directions to try to fill some of these knowledge gaps as well if we can. Um, yeah, okay, good. Um, yeah, lots, lots to respond to. I mean, I think maybe the one thing I wanted to highlight because it was mentioned um, this question of bringing in social science, you mentioned the youth. Um, I think actually that's been one of the you know, uh, kind of strengths of the IPCC that it has made an effort to bring in a greater diversity of authors and that could be just by nationality and as was mentioned I'm the first you know, Latvian author they have outreach events to countries that are underrepresented by the IPCC um, real efforts to strengthen like Eastern European contributions for example or Iranian contributions or so I think that's been really good and obviously the trying to achieve gender balance and then the diversity of experiences. So yes, having more social scientists, but also having, um, I know there's been an effort to try to include people from the business sector, for example. So I think one of the challenges, well, that's, I think, a good thing, but as you mentioned, it does make it much more complicated because 
the lang it becomes a more political um, process. And so it'd be really interesting to discuss the outcome that has for for journalism and for for other you know the the findings. But um, on the whole, I think that somebody who's probably benefited from that, I think that that's um, you know very welcome, <coughs> and hopefully in the future that is see that. Excellent. Yeah, and I was just also reflecting on the fact that, of course, we haven't really mentioned that. I mean, if you're not paid as IPCC authors, it's not, you don't get any, it's not a project. Um, and a lot of the communication responsibility lies on authors. We take, I mean, I can, I haven't counted how many, how many presentations I've given on the Working Group 2 report, but I mean, I've had no, no money for any of those things, right? So it's a very much a kind of, you know that also influences what kind of who's, who gets who is part of the process because not everybody has the flexibility to be able to go and give talks all the time um or yeah even be part of the writing process so if, if these are things that are part of the ipc structure that have both negative and, and positive uh, solutions i would say um good yeah well uh two reflections um the first is that the more exact and specific science becomes, the easier it is for us to report on it. Um, there's a difference between being a communicator and a journalist. I mean, we have to scrutinize all stakeholders, including the IPCC, but what's helped me in my reporting is the world weather attribution where um, I was in touch with scientists when um, the rains happened in South Africa, and they very quickly actually could say, this is caused by climate change. There were rains in Vietnam where they went out and said, no, this has no correlation. This is a uh, one in a hundred year event. But so I, for the first time, named people and said, he drowned, he died from because of the climate crisis. That to me is important in sort of taking it the next step. But then I share your concern. I mean, I think the COVID, pandemic was an imminent threat to people, to Swedes. Um, so I, I'm a bit in opposition with you when you say, please couldn't you cover our climate demonstrations? It would give us muscles. That is not our job. You know, you can never ask media to be there to help an activist movement. And if, especially if there are only like 250 or, or 100, uh, 1,700 people in your climate demonstration. If there were 200,000 people on the streets of Stockholm, I promise you, you would get huge media coverage. But we have to sort of evaluate from a new standpoint as we do everything. We sit every morning with a lot of issues on our news desks. You know, what do we cover today? What do we not cover today? And um, um, I think the civic movement, I mean, there's a lot of science on that. It's in, in immensely important, but my big question at the moment is, what is actually going to be the sort of, um, what do you call the, the moment where more people decide that they actually want to engage? And it, I didn't realize that you're having internal discussions on, you know, how to go about it, because I think the, the problem with that is it's diluting the, the message. And my problem is that I covered this since the beginning of the 80s. I've always seen how <coughs> environmental sort of focus gets hijacked by a lot of interests because they know that like when the Brundtland report came and they started talking about sustainable development suddenly everybody used that word because that's where the money was and and now we see the climate that's where the money is the attention is and so you know the women's movement are sort of trying to move into the climate and that makes it very complicated for me as a journalist to because to that to me, that's the beginning to be off focus of what we're trying to talk about. That's my opinion. Well, in fact, that's actually what the um, the science is showing also that social movements are increasingly becoming extremely um, sort of integrated and, and sort of the different justice I mentioned, gender justice, racial justice, climate yeah, justice, yeah. all are integrated. I just taught a class on that yesterday for my students, so I've just read all the, yeah. the stuff, but that's exactly, um, and, and I can understand that that becomes, to some, for, for me it makes sense, but I, I understand that then what, what is the message? Who are the, who are the- It's not that it doesn't make sense, it's just that we're, we're talking about saving the world, everything, everybody, yeah. all special interests at the same time. And it becomes completely unmanageable, at least from my standpoint, because I have three minutes to do a story on national television. Yeah, absolutely. What? Exactly. 
Good. OK, so um, yeah, Matt, what do you think? thing about the sentence that they wrote and uh, the good thing that the scientists have to sign off on the correctness of all, all the messages from in the summary of the policy maker so far much appreciated. But I think it also it sort of reflects quite a few things uh, about the amount of information in that thing, about the task of the IPC to be always relevant but not always prescriptive, that is IP should be policy neutral. And it also reflects that the world is heterogeneous, that different countries have different circumstances, and they want that to be taken into account so that the message for the policymakers is relevant in a balanced manner, still signed off by the scientists and so forth. But also, I mean, language is a, um, it's, it's a factor. Um, the authors work in English. The panel then works in English, but the translation, the UN languages, for most of the time, some aspects are only in English. And the countries of people who don't speak so good English are, of course, a disadvantage. And things can happen, and that also complicates, clouds things that need to be clarified. Two personal um, memories. Uh, one is that we were talking about one text, and we didn't really get anywhere. And then your story says that, well, if you put a comma there, then it's clear. Mm -hmm. Discussion could be for three more minutes, and then somebody else says, yes, that makes it clear, the comma. Mm -hmm. And that's all that thing. And I mean, this is English, okay. uh, a comma matters. The other time, what the Spanish that I get was saying that, well, can we use some other word than earth? Why? Well, because in Spanish, as terra, that means two things. It means the earth and it means soil. Okay. People think about how to translate it in Spanish. I mean, these kinds of things also play. The same as Swedish. Yes. <laughs> and, and also make sort of the uh, language sometimes less tangible. So it needs to be read with care. And it ends up being this staccato kind of summary of policy makers, which will need an example to go uh, to. to yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, I think this is clearly there is there is a communication element. Well, I should say there are multiple communications dimensions, right? So it's it's really and if we're talking about science for policy, what does that what mean? And I think that the issue is also asking about sort of who's who the actors are, who are responsible for, for what for carrying what kind of message um, about this. So, OK, so. Um, yeah, I'll tell you, you've had so much yeah. to explain. Yes, <laughs> I, I do, I do, but I'm going to try to make it clearer. Um, you know, with the co cooperation and the language, we want everybody to understand this. We want the whole society to act on it. Uh, there are key persons, obviously, that has a bigger influence and a bigger impact, but we want um, everyone to understand the severity of, of this. Uh, and so if the language becomes a lot easier, like for a four-year-old, uh, that easy. Um, more people will understand it. More people will understand the urgency, and we will get the appropriation of the bigger society. We will get the people that works with advertising into this. We will get the people that works with film and that are now too busy with their lives, like everyone else. But if that's it, why a four-year-old? Why not a ten-year-old? A ten-year-old is good too. Okay. <laughs> ten-year-old is good too. No, it's just that we used four-year-old at, at a, an exercise and it turned out really well. Really? Really, really well. Uh, it was very hard for the researchers to do it, but it turned out really well. But um, uh, because because this is where the cooperation starts, and I, and I think it's beautiful that UNEP is is also like you inviting uh, activist organisations to have a speech in the dialogues now for the upcoming of the Stockholm Plus 50, and uh, we were all invited, and there were all these different voices being heard, and you know, and that makes uh, obviously uh, the activists feels feel a bit better about their their task <laughs> or whatever. Uh, the, the uphill movement, and but uh, <laughs> but we want everyone really to feel that they are on board on this. 
Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Francis. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we're going to get get Georgia's final comments, and then we'll have our little little break. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. I'll try to be uh, to be brief. So, um, we, we talked a lot about uh, communication in in, the, in our last reflections, and um, I think one of the one of the most um, one of the visualizations I've seen and really is kept in my mind is a very simple line saying um, climate change is not real for a period of time. Climate change is real, but it's not caused by humans. Climate change is real, it's caused by humans, but it's not bad. And then a very short um, line saying, oops. Now, I think, I, I really think we're not, that's a good and a bad visualization. So it's bad in the sense of, that it's saying, oops, I think we're not at the oops phase. And I think that's one of the key messages of, of the IPCC report. There is abundance evidence that we have the solutions, the technological solutions in place, the policies. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, uh, the political will and, and increasing uh, the, uh, the rapid, uh, like um, going into a rapid, uh, um, action, uh, but but I do think that the the IPCC of, over the years has played a key role in basically changing from all these uh, phases that I mentioned, starting from um, climate change is not real, that has been influenced quite a lot and massively by uh, by communications and misinformation campaigns by the fossil fuel industry, um, but this intergovernmental. Uh, ownership and the very fact that uh, that the reports are accepted by the governments meant that the negotiators uh, could not undermine the, the scientific basis. And so we moved on from climate change is not real to actually climate change is real. Then we moved on to the phase two of climate change is real but not caused by humans, which was also again um, um, uh, debunked uh, largely due to the IPCC. And then we moved on into climate change is real uh, and. It is caused by humans, um, but it's not that bad. And I think we all in this room agree that it is really bad. We've all experienced the impacts, both wealthy and, and poor countries. We, of course, poor countries having higher um, uh, impacts to bear. And then I think we're in this phase four where uh, we um, where we say climate change is real. Climate change is bad. It's us, it's humans. Um, but it's no longer avoidable. And I think that's what we really need to make sure that we communicate that uh, it is avoidable. So I think a, a large portion of this population of the youth uh, can feel hopeless, can feel doomed that, well, it doesn't matter what, what we do, but it does matter what we do. And I, I think that that's the, um, the biggest strength of this IPCC that provided very uh, abundance evidence that we can do it. It's a matter of, uh, and, and going ahead with the political will in place. Thank you. And thanks for bringing these words. Hope and June, they're also a huge discussion topic. So let's have a little break, um, a very short break. Definitely. 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes break. <laughs> and then, but don't run away, please. Uh, and for anybody online, I don't know. Oh, um, you can write comments or questions into the chat and then we'll also pick your uh, your questions so yeah good so see you back in uh, 10 minutes 11 19. <laughs> those of you online uh, feel free to put some questions in the chat we'll, we'll we'll start first with the audience here and then move to the to the um to the online audience for questions but just a couple of things I picked up from this discussion I wanted to mention. Thinking about this this long history and going back to the to the 90s, um, the first report I worked on climate mitigation was 1991, and at that time the UNFCCC didn't even exist. And in those years in the 90s, there was also this dynamic um, that no one wanted to talk about adaptation in the 90s. Adaptation was the enemy; it meant you were giving up. So that's a big change if we compare to those times that um, gradually, I think it took some years um, for the adaptation community to be fully accepted, but now of course it's extremely <clears throat> important. Um, and then another um, thing I was thinking about is this uh, improvement when it comes to um, science writing 
and communications because the IPCC is now employing more people to to work on this. Um, particularly, I think uh, now, for example, in the um, in the synthesis report, which is underway, in, in which I'm also involved. And so you, you wouldn't get long sentences like like that one, you know, because these writers are, are helping with that. And then finally, um, it's important to also remember that that scientists are, are people uh, and the views that come out can very much reflect the, the views of the individuals. In fact, there's a book came out some years ago. It's called The Secret Anarchy of Science. And, and that's what it's about, how individual um, scientists, you know, each have their own views. And these are part of the synthesis action. So, OK, so I'm going to turn it back to Lisa to moderate. Uh, thanks, Fred. But I do want to point out that that sentence was not written like that by the author. <laughs> that sentence ended up that way following the, the negotiations uh, with the government. So, um, him. It's not all our fault. But uh, but anyway, yes, good. Right. So now we have a chance. So you will give me a sign if there's any question online. So anybody listening, please. It's not verse, not here. Write a question to us. Um, I think we have. I know. Someone wants to say something. I, I also know that you had a comment that you or a question, something you wanted to say, and that we, okay. yeah. Okay. Could you introduce yourself also to everybody? Uh, I'm Michael Watley. I'm an Oscar winning film director and a scientist. More to the point, I personally, with my partner here, Dr. Berger, we must have, we personally talked to five of the six uh, IPCC authors of AR6, okay. co chairs of uh, AR6, co chairs. And we've also talked to the intellectual heads of the um, emissions gap report. And this question is from them. How do we actually inform the Swedish electorate who actually runs the scenes, never mind blaming the Swedish government, of two things? First of all, for 50 years on this anniversary, for 50 years you've been Dallas. You've basically gone on everything now, nothing for the future. Right? You're asking me? No, 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 no. no. I'm saying, I, I'm posing a big question to all of you. Okay. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to look at you. <laughs> You're my fellow uh, media, so, media person. No, it's a question to all of you. How do we inform the Swedish who, after all, are the ultra high developed? There are 26 ultra high developed. Uh, Swedish is number seven. How do we inform them that for 50 years, They've basically been Dallas, including right now, solve COVID for me now, stop the war, keep my prices down, everything for the present, nothing for the future. Secondly, most importantly, how do we inform the Swedish electorate of what their nation should be doing by responsibility, by their contribution to global environmental degradation, which means that's what they should be doing to stay within the science limit where we have the carbon budget, 415 or 2C or whatever it might be. The argument is that IPCC currently cannot do this. That's the message from the co-chairs and indeed from the emissions gap report. The pressures from government have stopped them from really effectively communicating to electorates. The idea is that if we can't manage to communicate to the ultra high electorates, including Sweden, of their responsible reductions, then they won't, the responsible national reductions, then no one else will do it around the world because we're the highest developed, we have the most money, education, and so on. I didn't mean to look at you personally. <laughs> What's the answer to this question? Can we reform IPCC and actually expect them to do this kind of national communication because we have no global government? Or do we find another effective mechanism to do that? Yes, sir. And can we, I think, okay. I'm glad you have something to respond. I think you have asked a huge question mm -hmm. with lots of, lots and touched on lots of things that we've touched, uh, spoken about here. I was wondering though, if maybe we could ask Svante, who also had a thought very much aligned with this, I think, maybe if you could introduce yourself and explain sort of your, your, uh, yeah. Yeah. Could I, stand that? Or could I sit here? I think you should sit there because uh, everybody can hear you. Yeah, okay. Uh, as I said, I'm Svante Bodin. Uh, I have a long history with IPCC and I see so many of my old friends and colleagues uh, uh, on the panel here that I've been working with. Uh, but uh, uh, what I would like to raise here is uh, an issue that you have not covered so much. It connects with your question, but uh, it addressed this maybe slightly different. I organized 
the very first IPCC assessment meeting, as a matter of fact, which took place in 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 Sun, Sun, Sweden, 1990, together with the first chairman, Bert Polin, who was also my professor when I went to the university. And since then, I've been in and out when it comes to IPCC, and uh, I I retired after having uh, had the pleasure of being head of delegation to IPCC then. Uh, from 2007 to 2009, and I ended with being part of the uh, Swedish presidency delegation to the COP negotiations. So I've also been working then uh, with uh, as a recipient of uh, IPCC information on the government <coughs> on the political side, not as a politician, but as a civil servant. But civil servants play a very important role in communicating the IPCC basic messages to the politicians especially governments. But uh, so this comes to my uh, my question or issue that, that maybe could be discussed a little, and that it has IPCC served its purpose in informing the governments. I mean, it's still an intergovernmental panel that was set up, not uh, its main purpose to communicate the scientific findings to the general public or the electors, but to the governments to help them actually handle and get a grip on, on the climate issue. And uh, I say that because I have also had uh, the opportunity to see how, how science has been brought into other international environmental issues, like the Montreal Protocol for the Protection of the Ozone Layer, or for example, an issue that's been very important in Sweden, acidification of, uh, of waters and land, uh, which was a huge problem some 15, 20 years ago. And if you look at it, it the intergovernmental panel of climate change came before actually the mm -hmm. negotiations started and COP was uh, or UNFCCC was established. And then there have been two separate entities. But in the other cases, science has been integrated into the conventions directly and served the purpose of the convention by being there all the time and supplying the scientific information needed to make progress, to fulfill the goals of the convention, like the phasing out of ozone depleting substances or cutting down of the emissions of sulfur and other that acidifying substances, and had very elaborate scientific structures. There was a difference between that and scientists, people could say, were accused of being kidnapped by the politicians, but that was not. I never heard any scientists complaining about being part of the policy process. On the contrary, they have been very happy doing that. Uh, but here, you have a discussion in a uh, in an organization that is not uh, political in that sense. That is part of the negotiations of climate change, being accused of being, being political, which is a little funny. Uh, but so the question is, could there be other ways actually of doing this, or have we invested so much in IPCC that is, we have to live with it forever <laughs> and never being able really to have more effective, you could say. Uh, integration of science into the work of the, of the global challenge. Thank you. Yeah, so you're, um, I think I'm going to take these two questions first just because I think that they they do relate and you, because you also have been in the role in the government, um, the question is about how can we speak Swedish electorate? How does kind of what I suppose we might you might see like where are the bottlenecks, like where does the information not flow? But you might also see sort of where is the information supposed to flow? And and as Santos points out, that the way that the process was structured was very much like this the intergovernmental panel, that's the client, remember, it's the government, they're the ones that the authors write this report that then is presented to the, the governments in the policy process as well. But of course in the, in the so it, it um, but as Toya has pointed out, of course, there's a lot of other people reading these reports now. It's not just going to governments. It's also, especially we have this huge movement, of social movement that's, that's sort of also picking up all these reports. So I think that the, the question is really around where, where, who are we writing for? Who, who is responsible for making this sort of, uh, this serving the purpose of, in some ways, not, not necessarily just communicator, but somehow the boundary person or organizations who kind of act between the, the decision makers, the people who vote for them, maybe the civil servants and the, and the scientists um, in their various roles. So, um, yeah, I guess we, we yeah. Excuse, could I yeah, excuse you? Add? 
you know, I, I wanted you to focus. I, the question is more focused on national responsibility by the contribution to global environmental degradation. In this case, it's greenhouse gas emissions. Now those numbers are known. So for example, Sweden should roughly be reducing per year now, 27% per year now for 1.5. This isn't published anywhere. It's very well known, it's a simple calculation. The calculation is available for all countries. The point is that the ultra high countries like Sweden set the standard for the rest of the world who have far less money and far less responsibility. So the question is really, how do we communicate responsibility to the citizens? Because we can't expect the governments to really act unless they have the electorate support. So the governments, of course, should be informed as well. But it's really about responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. No responsibility. But I think, yeah, anyway, um, great. OK, so maybe I, I know Erika, you were already sort of answer. So maybe you want to take a first stab at this, this dimension of the question. Yeah. Um, firstly, this figure of 27 percent nearly comes, I believe, from a WWF report that came out a few weeks ago and we did report on it. So it's not true that it hasn't been reported on. Uh, or if, if it was Kevin Anderson, I mean, there, there was this report that came out. So Yes, we have reported on that. Um, I sort of don't agree with the basic assumption of your question that Sweden, because we are one of the most developed uh, countries in the world, therefore you would expect us to be the best at reducing our carbon footprint. The reason I'm saying that is because uh, Portugal is the EU country that has the highest electoral support for climate reform. Why? Because Portugal is one of the most effective countries with forest fires and droughts. So the Portuguese are feeling this and they have given their politicians a mandate. I think few politicians in, in the EU have. And Portugal is the country which is nearing to fulfill their um, obligations or, or what they promised under the Paris Treaty. So there I see, I was there did stories. It was very interesting to see the connection between feeling it onto your skin and actually doing it. I think that is the problem in Sweden. Most Swedes still don't feel the urgency. I mean, we did have floodings in, in Gävle. I have written a whole book how we are losing, uh, you know, the Arctic part of Sweden, the Fjällen as we call it because of global warming. But um, I don't think that the way to go forward is to personalize the climate crisis and address individuals' carbon footprints who are way too large, of course. But, you know, there needs to be political reform. Um, but how? I mean, I am at a loss together with the rest of you, I think, how to do that. But um, I think your hope for Sweden is sweet, but um, <laughs> <laughs> don't 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 think it will be the fact that we are, you know, highly educated that actually will make us become this sort of beacon in the world. Then what do we do by it? Well, go to Portugal. Yeah. Well, but that we've got 187 nations. Yeah, but what I was saying is that you have to look at where you were talking about electoral support. And I'm saying Portugal is a very interesting case in point when it comes to that. Um, yeah, I think this is so we're sort of touching on a lot of different challenges, though, because we exactly we have these different responsibilities. We have the we know that needs the action like, but at the same time, here we have this sort of this interesting creature, the IPCC, that is part of the structure and is supposed to be part of this sort of guiding the action and providing that, that scientific underpinning. And um, yeah, Marco, you wanted to do something else? Well, um, in three parts, um, the IPCC does global assessments. It doesn't go into country level, it doesn't go into local level. That's the IPCC range and that's how it is. And in terms of language and communication and, and, and some of the policy makers, I mean, there is a need of extra layer of communication on national level. I mean, we have done some like in Sweden and I mean, others as well. Well, take into account sort of national circumstances, more specifically the literature, which is specific for the national circumstances and so forth. And that, that adds great value. Some of the policy makers, I usually say, are written for the people who advise the politicians, if you like. The science rigorosity requires that it's transparent to science, so it can't be sort of hot like language without reference or something like that. So that's sort of the um, second thing is that 
I don't think there's any consolidated science on what's equitable. I mean, IPCC discusses equity as a very important aspect, but not the specifics, like in the Climate Convention, we made the article too, that what dangerous climate change, well, it's a, it's, it's a very exact word, <laughs> but the specifics, what it actually means is, is less so. And this, um, what is the right target uh, of commitment by different countries? There are some, WWF was mentioned, Kevin Anders was mentioned, I saw another paper just yesterday uh, about this one, and I had very different conclusions. To, um, when, um, on the Swedish case, I mean, the Swedish parliament has all the parties at one, um, sort of uh, behind the climate policy framework, which has this net zero goal by 2045. Without discussing here what the net zero actually means. <clears throat> and at that time, it was a, an ambition goal. It was a head to global curve as well, which doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right Sweden to do it, but you know, and so forth. And there's a process of following it up. The Swedish government is you know, discussing about consumption based targets also for Sweden and so forth. So there's a movement in this direction. But yes, Sweden is neither doing enough in the sense that we would be heading towards our national targets. It's a kind of policy council that has very clearly said that it should be going much faster if they are going to go net zero by 2040. There's a lot of aspects to respond to you, and, and I can respond to one to when you give the call again. Okay, so let's see. We, we're kind of running out of time, so I want to we've got about 15 minutes left before we're supposed to end, if that's correct. There is a question online as well, and um, yeah, I know you have questions as well. So let's just go so, so we don't completely lose the people online, um, and then I'm going to give the panelists a chance to respond as well too, if they have any final things to say. Yeah, so we can take two online questions since we had two here. So um, <clears throat> the first is from our good colleague uh, Richard Klein, who's also a longtime IPCC author. That's uh, decades. Um, and uh, so it was mentioned that the seventh assessment, the timing of the seventh assessment report means it could assess the extent to which climate action has been effective uh, in responding to earlier calls from the IPCC and the global stock take um, under the Paris Agreement of the FCC has a similar objective. So here are, here's the question. What would the IPCC need to do differently to provide useful input to the stock take? And then um, Second, the conclusion of such an assessment um, and the global stock take is predictable. So, of course, action is, is not sufficient. So what else could IPCC do other than say, oops, as Georgie was saying <laughs> earlier? Um, so that's question. Should we take the second one, too? Yeah, yeah. great that you're okay. there. This is just Richard. Yeah. Um, so the second um, is um, from Nessie. Uh, the, if the scientific community, um, as expressed through IPCC, made explicit value judgments on the safeguarding of human civilization within planetary boundaries, would this strengthen or compromise its influence on policymakers? So that's the second. Mm. Okay. Thank you for that question. Okay, so let's see. We we can we're going to go with these two questions. And I would also let any of the panelists, if you want to have any other thoughts about these the first questions as well, not that you have thoughts. Yes, yes. Well, I can take the first one. Um, I mean, process wise, now when the sixth assessment report is coming to close, the panel will start discussing the seventh assessment cycle and, and how should it look like, what kind of reports could be written, and so forth. And this will hopefully start in the fall and take maybe a year or so. The panel has already noticed <coughs> or made note of the, the Paris Agreement, the global stockholding process, and, and that there's a five-year cycle in the policy assessment within the climate negotiations. The IPC reports tend to take six or seven years time. So there has been a process which has led to a handful of alternatives, uh, which I hope can be part of the discussion of the seventh assessment cycle. Different countries have had different thoughts, which is available in the internet, the IPC homepage. Um, anything to go into longer assessment cycles, to shorter assessment cycles, to doing things like the 
like the IPC does now by having a solid middle period product which would provide to the group as well. But and the other idea which of course they wanted to redo in the working group structure. So I mean there are many thoughts out there. The process wise it will be sort of dealt with now it's maybe this year next year. Okay, yeah, exactly. And I think that you have some cultural comments in the comments. Yeah, it's to jump in that question on how to contribute to the global stock take. I mean, you're correct in that there's discussions right now about whether or not the IPCC report should be timed with that. Um, but that aside, I think one major gap, and this maybe gets to your question about the national level, um, because the IPCC, you know, historically has relied on published peer reviewed literature, and we haven't been using the gray literature as much. And many of the, for example, in adaptation, the current report. Um, was informed by this global adaptation monitoring initiative that looked at peer reviewed literature, but didn't really get into the gray literature, the government reporting about what they're doing, what's going on. And that means we're actually missing a lot. And I think for the stock take, it would be important potentially to start looking if you wanted us to assess how far progress has been made. We would also have to look at like, government communications, not just the peer reviewed literature. Um, and that would be something to consider for future cycles. Uh, as well as then there gets to this question of can we be policy prescriptive? The IPCC has always tried to stay away from the national level, kind of making these judgments on explicit judgments on you know who's doing more or less, and that would either then have to be in the scientific literature. So as you say, if there's an overwhelming body of evidence that we can't ignore, then you can report on it, or we'd have to have some kind of agreement that yes, the IPCC can start making those type of assessments um, and I assume that won't change. But that gets to your question about <laughs> the relationship with the convention and how far we can and can't go in informing action. Yeah. And I think this issue about the value judgment question is also relevant. I mean one of the ways that we go about go around that is to anchor kind of the normative dimension in the sustainable development goals, which have already been agreed by all the governments and say that this is, you know, this is what governments have said they want to do. And therefore that's kind of how we line what we say in terms of, you know, if you want to achieve the SDGs, then this is what you need to think about for adaptation and vulnerability and impacts, for example. Um, so yeah, so any, um, actually, well, let's go just see, yeah. Um, you have some yeah, maybe not a direct reply to the take a question but in in the beginning i mentioned how uh, there were a few people that really shaped my understanding of the ipcc process and richard klein is definitely one of them so i'm really glad to see richard that you're a uh, part of the uh, of the audience uh, but since you alluded into that oops that i mentioned before i think uh, i'm not sure um, the extent to which the ipcc has a role in that but but i do believe that uh, one of the key enablers for moving ahead is um, creating um, anger, as much as that sounds weird, to fight against the apathy that um, that we have in society in terms of, um, I, mean, I alluded it before, in terms of uh, feelings of hopelessness or doom. And there is literature, and I think this IPCC report very clearly, uh, the main report has a lot of uh, references from uh, Naomi Oreskes, Geoffrey Sofran, and, and a number, a number of scholars out there that they talk about, um, well, the, the fossil fuel industry and the huge misinformation campaign. And I think we need to have a fight against that um, and have uh, and kind of acknowledge the history of, of uh, climate misinformation and let it make us angry and let mm -hmm. it enable us uh, to take action. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe you should change oops and by God, what have you done? Yeah. <laughs> that creates more personal responsibility for it. Sure. Yeah. Can I just say uh, super quickly to your uh, thoughts there? Um, we had uh, a talk by Catherine Trebek from the um, Wellbeing Alliance, Wellbeing and Community. And she said such a beautiful sentence, and I will never forget it. Uh, maybe the economic growth has done its part in our part of the world and we have arrived. And uh, I think it's a very beautiful and relaxing thought. And why should Sweden, uh, why should Sweden not be the first country to really, uh, we have everything and more, 
Mm. We have more than we need and still we want more instead of getting the dignity and solidarity with uh, the lesser developed countries in this stage. Uh, I think it's uh, just very refreshing. Mm, thank you for making that. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, these issues are coming up in the literature, right? As well, so as we could say. Um, so we've got two more questions, and I think then we're going to have to get, take your questions, and then I'm going to give the panel a chance to kind of reflect on the questions, and also have a final anything you want to say. Um, so, um, yes. Uh, I was um, very surprised to hear that you say that uh, social science makes your work more difficult, and I would like to, uh, if you can give us an example of why social science uh, makes your work more difficult and what do you think uh, social science could bring to the table to actually make things easier for you as communicator or, or as um, uh, part of the ICC process? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Very good question. Okay, <laughs> yes. And thank you. So, uh, and apologies for the status of my voice, but um, I'm Amanda Cron. I'm with the UN Human Rights Office and the Environment and Climate Change team there. Um, and thank you also, first of all, for the very rich discussion. Um, I had a quick reflection and question based on some of the points already raised about communication and clarity and sort of engagement beyond the scientific community. And this is also against the background of, of course, both the summary for policymakers of Working Group 2, referencing the importance of rights-based approaches, participation, inclusion, and later on the summary of Working Group 3, referencing uh, climate justice. And of course, in parallel to this, we've seen last year both the establishment of a UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Climate Change, as well as the recognition of the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment by the Human Rights Council. And so I would be interested in reflections by the panel on sort of opportunities for meaningful participation, including by uh, observers and civil society uh, in this space, and sort of maybe uh, building a little bit on the points that have already been made, I think, on um, access to information about both the findings, but also the process of that specific. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great. OK. Did you also have one final question? A very short one. Okay. Um, I would suggest if we are discussing the future of um, IPCC now to change that we should add a summary for future generations. Uh, we proposed it once to so the IPCC. It never happened. And obviously included in that has to be information that national groups like Greta here, if she can't demand from her own government what they should be doing, then where does she get the information from? So maybe that could be an idea that besides for policy makers, we do one for um, future generations so that they can get the right information to ask their government to do the right thing. Yeah, well, I like that. Um, and actually, there's nothing stopping somebody from organizing that, but yeah, maybe an official thing as well. Okay, great. So I think what we're going to do is I'm going to ask Erika first, because you got a direct question about the reporting on social science. And maybe then I'm going to just go down the table here and, and let you give final thoughts about this, any of the questions. Uh, and obviously, we could be here for hours more, but yeah. I think that would be, <laughs> that would be really exhausted. So, um, as uh, Toya was saying, we're already very, very uh, worn out from all the, <laughs> the communication on IPCC and so on. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for your question. So, um, as I said, I've been at it for a long time. I started as a climate correspondent in the 80s. I've traveled vastly as a correspondent, which I am proud of because I think the stories I bring home from, I've been to 120 countries by now, I think, and in Africa and Asia. Before the climate debate um, surfaced, uh, we were aware of huge amounts of injustices, right? You have North-South, you have the patriarchy, you have the gender issues, you have the suppression of indigenous people. I mean, a whole vast array of questions that rightfully have been uh, surfacing and addressed in you know, different UN conferences. And then when I go to the COPs, I suddenly realize that everyone have arrived there. They still have their agendas, as I've heard them have, you know, for decades, rightfully so, you know, but suddenly they sort of added the prefix climate to it. So what I'm saying it is making my work more complicated, not in any way diminishing, of course, the, the urgency and importance of, you know, different, but they are 
in my view, as a reporter, they become a, not a sub-interest, but they become a diversion if we are looking at the fact that we are frying the planet, we have three years to cut emissions. I try to focus on, you know, what is actually going to make that happen? What will cut emissions? Um, and not being disrespectful of the gender issue, for instance. Mm. And to end this, I think climate justice is hugely important. I think we speak, don't speak enough about it in Sweden. I try to address it. In my reporting, I have plans for the fall leading up to COP27 to focus on it. Um, so having said that, that is, I think, uh, it's going to be one of my, my focus issues. That's great to hear. And I should, I think it's maybe important also to point out that social science, of course, addresses all sorts of things, including um, you know, why you have what policy bottlenecks and that sort of thing. So it's not just about the sort of gender and, and justice issues, but of course we we bring a different methodological perspective and different way of looking at the same issues, but but just uh, yeah, come, come at it with with different. Did different... you understand my answer? Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, good. So I'm going to go going to go here now, and Cynthia, you can start. At... Sure. Um, so so I won't answer any of the questions, but just to say, looking forward, I think it is an opportunity for us to you know. To, in order to avoid the oops and just keep saying what we've always been saying and having no action, I think it might be time to reconsider the way the IPCC works. So, for example, maybe we don't need to have three working groups. Maybe we should have integrated assessments across the groups um, going forward. But also getting back to your question about the conventions, maybe it's also time to reconsider how effective our you know, UNFCCC processes are. And I was just at a meeting elsewhere in Stockholm where we were discussing actually how the human rights, the way the human rights conventions work could influence lessons for you and FCCC and can we learn about how to improve processes and how to change some of these processes going forward. So I think that's something for all of us as a community, if we want to see action, maybe now is a good time to say what can we do differently to ensure that we don't just sit here and in five years say oops. Thanks. Yeah, and it's been a little bit ironic, of course, that there's a huge body of literature that actually does look at how could these processes be changed that could actually be integrated into the scientific process. Mm. So good, yes, Mike. Well, three things. I hope. Um, first of all, I mean, what's clearly shown in the latest IPCC report, what comes across, is the connection between climate mitigation, climate adaptation, and sustainable development. So, I mean, different agendas, and rightly so, are sort of going more and more into one another, which is about the measures and synergy and all that sort of stuff. And that is coming from the science. And um, also reflecting, I guess, what the society is going with discussions. The other thing is observers are present in the IPCC process, as you probably know. And there are some hundred plus observer organizations and they can speak uh, after the countries. Uh, so forth. the observers can also nominate authors and that sort of stuff. And there are also other ways, EMB is there before, for example. And I believe that is a good thing. That can also be very sort of good. The third one, I mean, you mentioned trade literature, and indeed the IPC procedures allow use of trade literature. But of course, it puts an extra responsibility on the authors to assess the contents that is unbiased, that it's, it's, it's correct, it's, it's balanced, and all that sort of stuff. And there's another discussion, which is how does one capture information from different languages, published in different languages. And there's more. And the third one, which is my perhaps new personal favorite, and how does one deal with predatory journals, for example? I mean, articles which are scientifically published, but are not as mm. rigorous as they should be. And again, it's, it's, a, it's a responsibility for the authors, and of course the process also has to reflect that these things need to be dealt with. Mm. It's part of the, part of the work. Like clients, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. So, so all sorts of different knowledge process. And of course, I think it's worth also mentioning that in the Wigner 2 report, we made a huge effort to try to integrate indigenous knowledge, but it isn't, there was some pushback from governments, but in the way that this had been integrated, because most of this knowledge isn't written down. And so it's not, it, it isn't able to be treated in the same way as the, the either the gray literature or the peer review literature. And that was, so we need to think about that yet. But sorry, time is running. Okay, Marianne. Well, um, I think uh, 
like I say, is on the gold way in uh, taking this integrated approach between mitigation and adaptation and through resilience thinking, which is the sort of science is there. So, uh, and also by then involving uh, local communities and uh, indigenous people. So, um, that, that is, I think, most interesting to integrate <laughs> all of those three um, working groups would be one way of minimizing the, the amount of <laughs> read to read later. So, yeah, I, I think that would be interesting to really integrate those things and not think in those silos. Yeah, absolutely. I think makes sense. OK, I'm going to <coughs> go to Georgia and Toya and then if you have any final thing that you want to say. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So, well, I, I, I think my my experience is not enough for me to share suggestions in terms of the IPCC reform or anything like that. But what I would like to, to uh, close this with is um, a, a quote from uh, Inger Andersson from uh, UNEP that uh, to me was one of the most um, uh, frustrating or infuriating finding, saying that the last two decades saw the highest increase in emissions in human history, even though we know how much trouble we're in. And so that clearly emphasizes that we are now not in an information deficit problem. So um, what I would be excited to see is uh, the role of the IPCC report um, on, on becoming a catalyst for, um, for protest. And just closing with that, I'll uh, just um, mention how I'm looking forward to joining the Friday, Fridays for the Future um, uh, protest that is this uh, Friday. And I invite everybody to, to join. Yes. Okay. One o'clock at Odenblad. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, when, when I was uh, in Katowice uh, for the COP24, and I had a big sign, and it said, uh, I want to be able to look into the eyes of my son and say everything I could. And um, I stand by that, uh, of course. But I'm thinking with the IPCC and with all of us in the room and everyone who has understood the severity of, of this uh, problem that we're in, uh, to imagine themselves in 20 years time, did we speak up? Did we do everything we could? Or were we staying within our comfort zones and not being, um, you know, not being uncomfortable uh, in order to, you know, keep on having friends and work and so on. And this is the time, I think, we have a very little uh, window left to start seeing the level, the, the everything going down instead of continuing up. And this is the time to, to speak up and be bold and uh, and uh, take action and uh, be proud of what we're doing uh, rather than regret in a few years' time. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, did you have anything left to add? I just want to say thank you. I think, you know, I've never been on a talent panel of this kind, and I think it's been really interesting, a lot of food for thought that I needed in my work. So thank you. Thank you. thank you to everybody for joining. And I just also make it not just a huge thank you to Francis because this is actually Francis' idea. And I think that you need to make huge appreciate it. It's a pleasure to to have this group together. Actually, it's it's um, definitely a great investment of our time. There was a final question on the chat, which is we're not going to answer it, but it's a good thing to um, finish with. And the question was. When we reach 1.5 degrees of global warming for the first time, how will this affect your community and your work? That's something to think about. But uh, a little known fact, well, it's known amongst us, but we have already surpassed 1.5 degrees over land. Uh, this, this, the the 1.5 references is the average over land and ocean. And of course, land is where people live. And that means where <clears throat> that means the impacts are being felt very seriously, and this was brought out very clearly in the land report, which is in another work. So the, the impacts are already here, and that's making your job a little bit easier, I suppose. Um, but anyway, thanks a lot, and uh, Thank you. we finish.